If you're an entrepreneur, you know what it means to take personal and financial risks, create jobs that support your community, and devote most of your time to your business. But do you know how to plan for a successful exit from your business? Do you know who should be involved in creating your succession or transition plan and the steps along the way? Welcome to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman from Legacy Business Advisors. The podcast theme is inspired by critically acclaimed business author, Bo Burlingham, author of Finish Big, how great entrepreneurs exit their companies on top. In this podcast, you'll hear success stories of exit plans done right and pick up practical tips based on years of legacy business advisors, expertise, and knowledge about the largest and most important financial transaction of your life. Now, on to the show. Good afternoon. This is Mark Dorman, your host of the Finish Big Podcast. And today I'm very excited to introduce my guest and become a really good friend and somewhat of a mentor for me. Uh, his name is Jay Douglas Druschel. He's a senior member of the law firm of Critchfield, Critchfield and Johnston with offices in five cities in the Northeast Ohio market, including Medina and their home base in Worcester. Doug started in Critchfield uh, in 1979 after a two-year clerkship with a federal judge in the Cleveland area. He's always been a Worcester native, and by note, I know Worcester has been one of the most fabulous micro-economies in America, so we'll touch on that a little bit. Doug has an undergraduate degree from Northwestern University and his law degree from The Ohio State University. He brings over 40 years of experience to today's podcast as a counselor and counsel, counsel to a number of businesses who have transitioned successfully. And I'm sure he's got some stories he can share with us in that regard. Doug's represented over the years buyers, sellers, lenders, and investors in transactions ranging from hundreds of millions of dollars to very small deals and everything in between. In Northeast Ohio, Critchfield is recognized as the go-to firm for legal services in the transaction marketplace. And Doug's insights are highly sought after and rather unique as he brings to the table not only corporate experience, but also the ability to weigh in on other issues which in, invariably arise in transactions such as real estate, tax, labor, employment, banking, and estate planning. Uh, I will also add to that that I know Doug is also a business owner himself. Uh, so we'll touch on that as well. So without further ado, Welcome, Doug Druschel. How are you today? Doing well, Mark. Good to see you and be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I've known your firm for over 25 years. I've known you uh, the same length of time, and uh, I just know how well-respected you are, uh, not only within your own law firm, uh, within the business community of Worcester, but within Northeast Ohio. You've got a great mind, and you can really have a, a terrific style that allows you to communicate complex issues uh, in in a very practical and understandable manner. So we've got a lot to cover here, Doug. I want to get started. Uh, let's go back to, you're a Big Ten guy, right? You started uh, at Northwestern and ended up at, uh, how they say it here in, in Ohio, the Ohio State University. How did you end up at, uh, at Buckeye Nation? Born and raised. I, my father was uh, at the College of Worcester. So I was born in Worcester and grew up here and decided after college and law school and a, two years away in, a, in Cleveland in a federal clerkship that uh, Worcester was a pretty good place. And the firm had a pretty good practice to do interesting and sophisticated legal work. And that's what drew me back. Yeah. So, I mean, Worcester, uh, for those of you that are listening, Worcester is really uh, kind of a somewhat of an island. As I mentioned, it's one of the, the, the largest and most vibrant micro economies in the U.S. Uh, as defined by the amount of GDP per capita. And Doug, I know your law firm has had, uh, once uh, Worcester was the corporate headquarters for Rubbermaid Corporation. And that's really what helped, I think, cement the Critchfield firm. And I, I think most importantly, the level of sophisticated issues that your firm has dealt with and grown from. Can you touch on that? Yeah, you're you're right about Worcester. There's a category they call the micropolitan statistical area, and Worcester has been ranked in the top, or Wayne County, perhaps you should say, has been ranked in the top five or ten of that 
almost every year for the last 10 or 15 years in terms of business growth and opportunity and, and deals that happen. And, and that's national ranking. That's a national ranking. Yeah, and uh, many years we've been the top one, two or three in that ranking. So we're blessed to have a very strong economy in an area that is somewhat rural, but close enough to the bigger city for the things you want to get to there that I can get to the Cleveland airport in 45 minutes and downtown Cleveland in an hour and Columbus in 90 minutes and so on. So we're well located to serve a, a broader geographic area, but without having to put up with the uh, congestion of the bigger city. Yeah. Plus you've got a very dynamic agribusiness area surrounding you, uh, Holmes County, not to give our folks a geography lesson, but it really lies on the Northern edge of uh, what is often referred to as Amish country, but uh, at the same token, it's got a huge manufacturing presence, particularly for a small town. It's a college town. The College of Worcester is there uh, and just great people, great families. I've got a lot of friends there, but I just couldn't say enough about Worcester, Ohio. And me being a Scottish guy myself, I love the fact that uh, the College of Worcester's mascot is the Fighting Scots. So let's move forward. We're here to talk on Finish Big about really – who should be involved in helping business owners get their hands around successfully exiting their business? And I want to touch on, you know, really your experience in, in, in having represented hundreds of owners over the years and owning your own business, I should say again. But there are a number of different elements that really factor into the de decision to sell your business. And when I say sell, I'm not selling necessary to private equity. As you and I know, you know, that might come come up once in a blue moon for a middle market company, but a lot of smaller companies, there's a lot of financial decisions, obviously emotional family considerations, and then certainly the employee in the, in, in, in the community considerations. What are some of the factors that you see from your vantage point that you share with your clients as you're counseling them? Well, the, the main thing I like to say is this is a team effort and Obvious team members would include the lawyer and the accountant, but it can include other things. It can include a, a Mark Dorman that has seen a lot of business transitions over the years. It can include, in some cases, other family members that are involved in the business that are being consulted about whether or not to do this transaction. It can include family members who are not in the business. It can include other business folks who have no stake in the game at all but are trusted advisors to the, the players involved. Depending on the size of the deal and the nature of it, perhaps an investment banker will be a part of the team. And for a, a, a much smaller deal, you might look at what they call a business broker. We don't run into that too often, but from time to time, there are folks who are kind of in between a, a realtor and an investment banker that are trying to match up buyers and sellers for businesses. Yeah. So the, the key I think is, is to put together a team. Mm -hmm. And I've, if I've said once, I've said a hundred times to the younger attorneys around here that better decisions are made with more information. And so the more data you can get, the more inputs you can get, the, the better the decision is going to be. Yeah. I think one of the challenges, I mean, I, I two points there and that, and that's just a, a great, a great line, better decisions are made with more information, right? What I love about the exit planning space and the succession planning space is truly the collaborative nature of working with other professionals who are, are all working towards the same common goal, which in that goal is the client's goal, right? Uh, a positive outcome. Some, some, uh, sometimes, uh, unfortunately, there is a little bit of fiefdom that goes on that it really takes a bit, a bit of uh, artistry on our part to allow other advisors to, in fact, collaborate, to say to them, look, we're all better off working together. We all see things through different lenses. And, and you would absolutely concur with that. Absolutely. The tax, for example, permeates everything we do. Mm -hmm. And I have a pretty good understanding of tax but it's the accountant that's going to have to file the tax return. So you can't just uh, run roughshod over that input. And there's other examples that you could come up with where you, you need to be a listener and you need to look at the, the overall thing. Deals tend to have a pattern to them, but everyone is unique. 
And for the seller, for most of the transactions that we work on, that seller is only going to do it once. Yep. And they better get it right. Yeah. Yep. I talked to my brother's an attorney, as you know, at Reminger and, uh, I'm always quick to remind him it's usually on the golf course because he'll talk about things, you know, just so matter of factly. And I said, you know, for that person, this is the most important transaction, whether it's an insurance claim or it could be the sale of a business. And this just might be another file for the attorney and another tax return for the accountant. But this is our client's baby, right? The folks that are listening to Finish Big, by and large, own their own business. And we've got one time to get this right. And so that's why we are obviously big advocates of planning and planning very early Yes. And using a collaborative team, one of the folks that I, I, I think you, you you shared that you've enjoyed listening to that we've had, you talked about family considerations. One of my good friends and uh, former guest of the show, Michael Klein, Dr. Michael Klein, wrote a book called Trapped in the Family Business. And sometimes, you know, family businesses are like a big ball of yarn. You're trying to unwind them and you're wrestling with equality, fairness issues, emotional issues, juggling, you know, two, three kids, who's in the business, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure... Fortunately or otherwise, you've had a front front row seat in some of those discussions over the years. Very much so. I, I've listened to most of your podcasts uh, while I'm driving here well, and there. Thank you. And the one with Kevin that you just mentioned really hit home with me because the family business is the bread and butter of, of our world. And we represent a lot of publicly traded companies too, and a lot of individuals, but the, the family business is is the key to our economy as a whole, really, if you look at it that way. And you're talking specifically Worcester. I would agree. I mean, there's some phenomenal families there, but family business runs America, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, but the the thing that hit home with me on, on that particular podcast was if it's a family business, does that next generation want to be involved? Mm -hmm. And I had very vivid recollection of a conversation I had with a fellow who's about my age, who was the third generation. And he and his brothers and cousins were the third generation of a very, very successful, well-respected business. And he said, under no circumstances, would he ever suggest to his children that they ought to be in that business? He said, they're welcome if they wanted to be, yeah. but he wasn't going to push it because he felt like he was coerced into being in that business. And he kind of had a chip on his shoulder for his entire adult life. And uh, he, I don't, maybe resenting it is too strong a word, but he wasn't going to do that to his kids. Yeah, sure. There is definitely a dynamic there. And that book is uh, another plug for Dr. Michael Klon, author of uh, Trapped in the Family Business for all our listeners out there. But Doug, let's, uh, let's move forward. So one of the things I want to talk to you, uh, share you really have you share with our audience is this whole concept of deal structure and many uh folks that might be listening driving their car perhaps are working out but walk us through some of the nuances of an asset sale or a stock sale okay. um specifically kind of maybe the ins and outs of that if you will when one might trump the other if I'm a seller, is it better for me one way? If I'm a buyer, if it's preferable another way, et cetera. So maybe we could just kind of peel away the onion one layer of a layer at a time and, and really help to provide some educational information to our audience. Yes. And it gets back to the comment I just made that tax permeates everything and, and tax permeates that decision analysis that you were just uh, teeing up there. The, the, in, a 30,000 foot view, the two basic ways to structure a transaction are either an asset sale or a stock sale. Stock meaning it could be units in an LLC, but let's call that a stock sale mm -hmm. where you're selling the ownership interest as opposed to the underlying assets. In almost all cases, a seller would rather sell stock for the very simple reason that it's going to be taxed at capital gain rates. And in almost all cases, a buyer would rather buy assets because a buyer who buys stock cannot depreciate that stock on his tax return going forward. Whereas if the buyer buys assets, whether it's real estate, equipment, what have you, that uh, those depreciable assets can be in fact depreciated, in some cases even have an accelerated depreciation that is an incredibly more favorable tax treatment to the buyer. Mm -hmm. And so that's the tug and the pull. So I would say probably 80 to 90% of transactions end up being an asset sale. 
for the reason that the buyer wants that and the seller has gotten to the point to say, I'm ready to sell. Mm -hmm. And so, well, okay, if, if you're telling me that's what it takes to get this deal done, let's get the deal done. And the, the seller will put up with that, even though it may not be quite as favorable tax treatment as a stock sale. One exception to that that you sometimes run into that I just have had within the last year is a company that has a lot of licenses or government permits or IP certain things that are owned by the company that are not readily transferable. Ah. If you have a company that has to do a lot of uh, bonding, for example, and the, the financial strength of the company, and it can't say it's not to say that the buyer couldn't get bonding, but it, you'd have to start all over again with that process if you are buying uh, assets as opposed to buying stock. So the one one I did recently, the, the seller had quite a few government authorizations in various states throughout the United States. And it just made no sense for the buyer to have to get reauthorized in pretty much every state in the United States. So in that case, they, even though it wasn't as tax favorable to the buyer, they bought stock. Mm -hmm. And it, a quick aside, don't want to get too down in, into the weeds on this, but there are some ways too you can buy stock and a buyer can still have it treated as if it were an asset purchase. But oh, interesting, interesting. A, and a, I know, detail, a detail we don't need to get into. Yeah, I know one of the other uh, features and our guest today is Doug Druschel, uh, one of the senior partners at the Critchfield, Critchfield and Johnston Law Firm located in Worcester, Ohio. Doug, if I buy the stock in your business, I've also bought any trailing liabilities. Is that a fair statement? Yes, and, and that's another reason that buyers typically want to buy assets. So I want a hard, fast, cut cut ties. I'll just buy the assets, the equipment, and assets also goodwill, maybe a customer list, things like that, right? Correct. Yeah, that's that's a, a big fear. In, in reality, that isn't usually an, a real factor, mm -hmm. but it's a real fear. Yeah. And so a buyer wants to know that I've got one more layer of liability protection in between me and that potential claim. The seller will be required in almost all transactions to give a pretty long list of what we call representations and warranties, which We're are going to cover that a list of things of saying, you know, here, here's the state of my company. And they'll always be asked to assure the buyer that there are no unknown claims, but buyers are still kind of nervous about that. And there could be, an, yes, okay, it's unknown, but maybe it's out there. We just haven't learned about it yet. And if I'm buying assets, I'm a little more protected from that. It's not a complete protection though, because there is the ability in some circumstances for a creditor of the old company to seek to have that claim satisfied out of the new ongoing business. So it, it's not an absolute guarantee, but it's one more layer of protection for a buyer that would augur in favor of an asset sale. Yeah, I mean, again, though, I think your point is at a high level that an asset sale favors the buyer, a stock sale would favor the seller, but a collaborative approach back to our earlier point would bring you the best solution for all parties. And that's where the negotiation takes place. Correct? Exactly. Okay. So exactly. it's, it's not, and I want to talk about this in a minute here. It's not just price it's deal structure because it's not how much you get paid. It's how much you get keep after we're paying uncle Sam, et cetera. Exactly. Okay. So let's talk about valuations in the marketplace. You've been doing this a long time, Doug, what would you say over 40 years? Yep. Over 40. Have you seen the market any, what's the word that the investment bankers, it's so hot, it's so frothy. There's so much dry powder out there. I hear this as if we're a bunch of Western cowboys, right? So, but there's a lot of money chasing too few good deals, right? And prices have gone up, but I also want to just throw in this, but now we've had 10 interest rate hikes in the last 14 months. The cost of leveraging that capital has become more expensive. And so you're starting to see valuations come down. To an extent, yes. I think, I mean, COVID threw a wrench into everything, but we're pretty much through that. But now we're seeing- uh, in, in what way? Can you just elaborate on that? Tell me more. Well, everybody was uncertain of the of their world. 
Mm -hmm. And there were many clients that I have that were literally devastated by COVID and they would have been out of business if it wasn't for PPP loans. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean but the, by the same token, I, and you and I both know this, we've had clients that were almost unaffected or their business actually grew during COVID, exactly. but yet their, but their balance sheets swole with PPP money. So they're, 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 they're highly, they're, they're cash strong. Business is good. They're like, what are you talking about? I don't see any pandemic. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it's a great irony that while COVID decimated some businesses, it helped other businesses. And it's it's kind of random as to what that would be. It depends on the nature of your business. But it was, even for those who were thriving with it, they were still dealing with an unknown future. Mm -hmm. the, the businesses who, who did better because of COVID knew that that wasn't going to last forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if I'm a buyer and your last year's earnings look great because you're selling Purell or something like that, right. that uh, may not be as much in demand next year. Well, I'm not going to value that business going forward. Based so you have this new thing called COVID adjustments or adjustments for COVID, yeah. right? It either negatively impacted and we can't really penalize you, although we'll try if we're buying and we're not going to pay you for something that may not repeat year after year. But right. back to my original questions, if we just took COVID and set it aside, uh, in the last 10 years, from what I understand in my travels, I know this to be true, multiples and valuations of private, small and private businesses are, are have never been higher. Is that a fair statement? That would be consistent with my observation. I, I can't say I've done enough of a broad study to mm -hmm. conclude that, but anecdotally i would agree with that yeah okay and 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 it is because there has been so much uh you i mean you have a, a number just a number of you know competing factors for such a long time we had almost zero interest rate the market began to stagnate and then alternative investments the this the, the thriving and popular private equity markets just exploded and they've got to deploy this money so they're out search their teams are out searching for deals uh, businesses that are prepared and have done some exit planning in a collaborative format are going to benefit from higher multiples, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So your thoughts on the ever-increasing interest rate environment on earn valuations today or going forward? Where do you see it going? Well, I, I, I think and I certainly hope that interest rates have peaked. So I, I think the average buyer is going to be comfortable knowing that whatever interest rate the buyer might be looking at today, it won't get any worse than that. And it should go down a little bit. So I, I think that will help. But having said that, it is still a higher interest rate environment than we've seen for quite a few years. However, it's important to realize that historically like, speaking, it's not that bad. <laughs> exactly what I was going to say. Historically speaking, we're in pretty much of a normal situation. Yeah. I mean, I'm old enough to remember a 20% prime rate and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're nowhere near that. No. And no. I've uh, read recently that the home building market is, is beginning to pick up because home interest rates are already starting to drop. And, but the interest rates today, while we think of them as high, it's because we were spoiled for a few years with, tiny, tiny interest rates that yeah. were unrealistically low. And now the the cycle is working its way through. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're a borrower, you're paying more, but if you're a saver, you're earning more. Right. So, you know, everybody right. wins. Right. And the, you know, that's what I tell my kids. And uh, to your point, you, you can always make better decisions with more information. Yep. You know, what do you think that I'm like, well, it depends. I need more information. <laughs> right. I mean, just, there's no correct answer. There's no one size fits all. So, Let's go back to deal structure for a minute. I know we're kind of bouncing around, but this is a great conversation. Deal structure. So I, I, we come to terms. We come to terms with the price you're going to pay me for my business, Doug. You're representing your buyer. And now all of a sudden, I've got this thing called maybe an earn out or a seller's note. Is this versus if I say, hey, I want cash. I mean, would it be fair for me to ask for maybe all cash? And you might say, hey, well, okay, but I don't have that much cash. I can't borrow that much cash. I can't pay you that much in cash. So you're going to structure me some on the if comer down the road. I mean, what, what's your advice there to, to, to our listeners? 
depends on the on the transaction. Every as we said before, everyone's unique, but the pattern that we tend to see in what I'll call the middle market is that there is almost I shouldn't say almost always, but in the vast majority of cases that in my world, there is some component of seller financing included in a transaction. It can be as simple as a seller note where the say it's a $10 million purchase price and the owner has a million dollars to invest and can borrow eight. So they're a million dollars short of a $10 million purchase price. So the seller says, all right, I'll, I'll finance a million dollars over some period of years at some stated interest rate. Mm -hmm. That's pretty simple. You can also see an earn out where the payment is dependent upon some factor. And sometimes the earnout is because the seller isn't quite convinced that the price should be as low as the buyer thinks it ought to be and vice versa. So again, take my hypothetical. If you have a seller who says this is worth 10 million because blah, blah, blah is going to happen. And the buyer says, well, that hasn't happened yet. I don't think it's only worth $8 million. And so a lot of times you'll see an earnout where the seller says, all right, you'll pay me the $2 million if that actually happens, because I'm sure it will. And they structure a transaction formula that will pick up that extra money. Each party's kind of hedging their bets there, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And sometimes it's a simple just saying, I think sales are going to go up. Of course, every seller says that. And the uh, I'll, I'll give you some percentage of the sales. Or Most often, it's a metric of something like a... Uh, multiple of earnings or you know profit-based formula where the the seller says this is going to be very profitable in the next couple of years because we just bought this new machine that is operating more efficiently or we just got this new huge customer that's going to ramp up sales or there's everyone's different but everybody seems to have a story about why their ship is just about to dock Correct. And the buyer is always saying, well, yeah, but it hasn't docked yet. So I'm not paying. I'm not <laughs> then paying why haven't you that. parked it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, that's good. That's good. Uh, one of the things that I see all the time, I'd love to get your opinion and, and your opinion to be shared with uh, some of our listeners here, but I often see particularly in older companies and, and particularly companies that maybe haven't had quality advisors over the years that they'll have real estate owned inside their corporation. And it becomes quite a, 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 a conundrum when you're trying to do exit planning and looking at their financial picture. And you say, man, if we could just get this real estate out of here, then I could sell the operating business. I could keep the real estate as maybe some rental passive income. And the accountants get on board to your point, got to, got to talk to them. And we want to talk to them. Uh, the tax uh, ramifications can be quite, quite penalizing. Have you seen or been party to any really unique structures there? And, and how often have you seen this, this kind of play out, the real estate inside the corporation play out in your practice? Well, the first thing I would say is if you have the opportunity to structure something going forward, never, never, never put your real estate in a corporation. Mm -hmm. Even an S corp has some baggage that goes with it for real estate in a corporation. So that's the first thing. But having said that, there's some, transactions that were, were done some number of years ago where the, the real estate is in the corporation. And as you suggested, it can be a tax nightmare. And basically, long story short, uh, you're faced with the risk of a double taxation by selling the real estate because you want to sell the real estate and it's been depreciated over the years. So it has a very low cost basis within the corporation. And if it's sold for some amount, that's a tax transaction to the corporation. And then if the owner of the corporation wants to say, well, I'd like to get that money out and put it in my pocket and do whatever with it. Now there's another layer of tax there. Mm -hmm. And so you want to try to avoid that if you can. There are different ways to deal with that. It's hard to generalize, but if you can do a transaction, for example, where maybe you keep the real estate in the corporation and you don't sell that asset, you sell everything else. Uh, there could be some places for a tax-free exchange of real estate. Most of the business transactions we work on 
not all. So in other words, I mean, let's just kind of just just elaborate on that. I could I could sell the assets in my corporation, but if my asset is part of the real estate, can I carve that out off to the side and just sell you maybe everything else and then sell my business and and, and then maybe rent you my my that's, uh, that's possible. It it depends on whether the <laughs> buyer... It depends, right? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. It, it, uh, you heard of the fellow who said he wanted to hire a one-armed lawyer, couldn't, so he couldn't say well on the other hand. <laughs> um, the It depends on whether... Uh, one of the big factors is, does the buyer want to have that real estate as an owned asset as opposed to something that's rented? If, it's the, if the buyer is willing to rent the real estate long-term, you have another set of options there that don't require you to bite the tax bullet and get the corp to get the real estate out of the corporation. If the buyer though says, I want that real estate, I want to have complete control over it. And a lot of times the buyer says, I got to have that real estate because the bank is requiring a first mortgage on that real estate as yeah. part of its security for my loan. And so sometimes you are just stuck with that fact. And there's some different things you can do to minimize that tax burden. But if you have real estate in a corporation, you are going to have a tax issue to deal with almost certainly. And it can be a tax headache or it can be a tax nightmare, but it's at least a tax issue. Right. I mean, and this goes to uh, really the essence of this show and the uh, the genesis, if you will. I, I, be, I become good friends with Bo Burlingham who wrote the book, Finish Big. And uh, when I approached him, he was just very generous and said, yeah, go for it. But it's it, it comes down to the, the whole thought of the sooner that you're, as a business owner, that you as a business owner, for our listeners, prepare to start to examine these, these options and these potholes that are out there that could derail, that can help you build the value in your business, mitigate or minimize taxes, surround yourself with a good team of collaborative advisors, the better the outcome is what Bo's seen after interviewing 10,000 business owners. And you would agree with that. I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah, that's great. So our, our guest today, and uh, Doug, I can't thank you enough. You are really one of uh, a true gentleman, one of the wisest guys we know. What's What, what did you say? I, I, I need I need more information, right? <laughs> need more well, information to make a, an informed decision, right? I just need more friends like Mark Dorman. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Our guest today has been Doug Druschel. Uh Doug is a senior partner at the Critchfield, Critchfield and Johnston uh, law firm based in Worcester, Ohio, serving really all of the Midwest from a beautiful community called Worcester, Ohio. I'd urge you to stop by there. It truly is one of the gems in the Ohio marketplace. I'm Mark Dorman. I'm your host of the Finish Big podcast, and we appreciate uh, you listening for those of you on the line. I'd urge you to share uh, this feed with all your friends. We're looking to expand our 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 growing list of listeners and, and sharing really what it takes to have positive outcomes with your professional and business life. So until we meet again, here's to finishing big. Thank you. And thank you, Doug. We hope you enjoyed listening to finish big, the podcast with Mark Dorman from legacy business advisors. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes are available. Learn more at legacybusinessadvisors.com or call 330-350-5410. Please be aware the information in these podcasts represent the views and opinions of our guests and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of legacy business advisors. The content is for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax or legal advice. Always seek the advice of your legal or tax professional with any questions regarding your specific situation.